oxide, and here I'm showing zinc, and you put the zinc oxide up at the top of the tower, and with the solar energy input, this reaction will go from zinc oxide, it produce zinc and oxygen. And you need the temperatures up at about, if you don't want to put any electricity in, you have to have a temperature of about 2200 Kelvin. So we're talking about high concentration. Well, what you get is zinc, which actually is a very expensive commodity, so you've actually produced zinc. And you produce oxygen, you separate those two, you let the oxygen go. And now you're carrying around zinc. You can do whatever you want to with the zinc, but one of the things that you could do with the zinc is you can hydrolyze it. So when you want hydrogen, you now react the zinc that you produced up in your solar reactor with water. You produce zinc oxide and hydrogen. This reaction requires heat input. This reaction produces heat. So you now take the zinc oxide that you produced and you just recycle it and go back up and start over again. So you haven't actually used any zinc. And you pull off your hydrogen. And so now with the solar thermal reactor, you've produced hydrogen in, a, in basically a cycle where the only feedstock is water. The only products are hydrogen and oxygen. And the only energy source is solar heat. So these are what people are thinking about. This is just one people are thinking about a number of cycles. So what are my projections for the future? Well, it's hard to project the future. If I could project the future, I'd be very wealthy instead of a university professor. Um, but it's my view that there's, you know, you hear this, the silver bullet, and then people say, no, it's a silver buckshot. Well, that's pretty much true. We're going to have to have a regionally appropriate technologies. It's going to have to be a mix. There may turn out to be a big winner, but most likely is there going to be a number of solutions. I think that diversity is very important in terms of putting capacity online and also in terms of energy security. Um, what can we do now to make this happen? We have to alleviate the economic and market barriers. So there are both economic barriers and market barriers, and we have to think very creatively about how to get those out of the way so that we as a country can move forward. Um, in terms of distributed solar, setting building energy efficiency standards that include solar thermal is very, very important. Um, California has really dramatically reduced demand uh, by setting very high uh, energy efficiency standards for buildings, and that should be done across the U.S. State-level incentives are necessary. Um, there are some federal incentives. They come and go, unfortunately, so I should say stable incentive programs are very important. Um, companies don't want to make an investment in a new product if they don't know that the incentives that they have this month they're going to have next year and the year after that. They have to be able to look into the future and make a business plan. So you have to have stable incentives. I think it's very important to have state level incentives um, to accelerate demand and to drive down the cost. Um, and then last but certainly not least, um, if my hot water heater breaks down this afternoon and I must have hot water tomorrow, I am not going to be able to put solar in because I can go to Home Depot this afternoon and I can get a new regular old hot water heater, but I cannot go pick up a solar system. And so the supply chain and the support of local businesses is very important if this is going to happen. So that's kind of where's the future. And um, I've been in the solar business for a long time. I was doing it before it was popular. And um, all my colleagues made fun of me. Now they all wish they had started out with me. Um, but I like to think about Vincent van Gogh, and I, sometimes I felt a little bit like him. I'm not the artist that he is, was. Um, but at the end, this is actually at the end of his life, he wrote this in his diary. He never sold a painting. And it really puts in perspective that what we do today, even though sometimes it seems like it's just not going where we want, in the future, it can have huge impact. So his 15 sunflowers sold in 1987 for $40 million. If you try to find prices of artwork on the internet, you will find that it's very difficult, but I did find this one. 
Um, so the things we do today can have huge impact on the future. So what's really wonderful for me to see as a professor is the students. The students are ready to go. Um, this is a photograph of the uh, Solar Decathlon, which is a collegiate uh, competition. Iowa State is uh, participating in it this year, as is the University of Minnesota, uh, to build a solar home and uh, erect it on the mall in Washington, D.C. So you can see that this is the, the mall, the Smithsonian Mall. Our, the people who are younger than me are ready to go, and it's really up to us to try to help them do that. Thank you very much. So I hope I left some time for questions, although the questions are the dangerous part of my talk. So, yes? Do you have any uh, knowledge of manufacturing techniques of some company that's building a 4x8 solar panel at the um, they're, uh, um, the solar, they're, they're generally called PVT systems, so photovoltaic thermal systems. Um, so you're asking me about manufacturing? I haven't seen anybody here displaying a single unit. No, there aren't any. Um, there is a uh, company um, that is um, Sun Earth, I think is uh, developing one uh, under uh, funding from the Department of Energy um, that uses a water coolant for the photovolta photovoltaics and then uses the heat that it pulls off the photovoltaic panels for solar hot water. Um, but they aren't widely commercially available. They, for those of you who aren't familiar with how they work, the, for photovoltaic panels, the panels that produce electricity, they're more efficient as the temperature goes down, uh, which means that people in Minnesota and Iowa should be happy about that. Um, and, uh, but they get quite hot. So uh, one, of the, the, one of the things that's important when you install them is to make sure that you have some type of way to prevent them from getting too hot. So people are actually thinking about pulling the heat off of those panels. And basically, the, it's a lot of heat because the efficiency of a photovoltaic panel is very low. So maybe, let's call it, say, it's 15%. Well, a lot of that other 85% is just converted to heat. So it would be very nice to pull that heat off and then use it for something useful, space heating, water heating. So companies are thinking about doing that. Certainly, those are available in Europe. Um, um, no, not here yet. Yes. I've been doing this since 1972. I don't know how old you are. Well, no, we have a contest, but let's do that in private. Well, <laughs> what I'm getting at is in 1972 to 1980, the cost was very affordable in my mind. And <coughs> uh, now that it's become mainstream, I'm seeing the price just get outrageous in my mind. I may be wrong, I feel $25,000, what used to cost $5,000 is a quite an increase in price. Part of that obviously is the cost of copper. Just because mainstream, does that make everything just more expensive? Um, well, there are two, I think there are two, the question was what's happened since 1972, why does solar water heating systems cost $6,000 instead of $2,500? $25,000. $25,000 for, oh, for a photovoltaic system. No, no. What must be for laundry? Well, a single collector, flat plate collector for solar hot water, is sells for about a thousand dollars. So, um, if you wanted to meet, let's say, 60% of your hot water load, you'd need two of those. So that's about two thousand. Uh, there's an installation cost, but that shouldn't be anywhere in the twenty-five thousand dollar range. I think you need to fire that. Well, this is for the for the space heating. Uh, well, if you have space heating, you have to have a lot more collectors. So, but I'm just giving you an idea. If you have space heating, you have to have a lot more collectors. But I can talk a little bit about the price. So without talking about the actual number, in 1985, the federal tax credits um, for solar water heating tapered off. 
And uh, up until that time, the, the price that consumers paid was much, much less because there was a very favorable federal tax credit. Um, so that's one reason that you see a different price structure now than you saw in the 80s. That's also because it's, it's years and years later and things have gone up. Labor rates are higher. Copper has quadrupled in cost. Uh, low iron glass is expensive. Manufacturing costs have gone up as energy costs have gone up. So the prices are higher now than they were in the mid-80s. But as you become mainstream, they do the to get more expensive. Um, well, they haven't become mainstream. So um, it is possible that with consumer demand um, exceeding local supply that the cost could be higher than you might like. Uh, but, but certainly as competition, I, I mean, I'm, I'm in the engineering school, not the business school, but I'm guessing that as the competition goes up and it does really become mainstream, costs will go down. A lot of the costs for solar thermal systems is transportation, distribution, marketing, and installation. And so the first three of those will go down as the market grows. Yes. Uh, on that diagram you showed us of different types of concentrating solar collectors, uh, the dish model, did, were the individual glass or mirror sections themselves uh, uh, parabolic or were they flat sections mounted uh, uh, tangent to a parabolic frame? They're, they're not parabolic, so these, the, they're, and these are made all kinds of different ways. Um, this one is in segments, and I'm not sure of the exact geometry, but these are not flat. Okay. So now, they do make some that are faceted and relatively flat. You have to have a lot more facets. Um, they also make some that are all one piece, okay. that are still... Wouldn't flat sections mounted on a parabolic frame be a, a cheaper way to go than trying to make curved ones? Um, yeah, but the optics would be much worse. Um, and when you start, if you make small little sections of flat, you can approximate it, but then, then those all have to be... They have to be individually adjusted. Yeah, they do. So I, I think that, uh, I'm not an expert in the manufacture of this, but um, the ones that you, this is an old one, but the ones that you see today do have probably maybe 12 or so, they look flat, but they're not flat, <coughs> sections. Yes. Me? Yes. Um, with the water model uh, to produce a fuel, the water is all about the resources. Yes. How, what do you get out of that? What do I get out of that water is a limited yeah. resource? Well, that is a, an important issue. Um, I think that a lot of people who, in the hydrogen economy has kind of gone out of favor. But, um, uh, but many of the people who are, um, very much against the hydrogen economy have done a number of studies on how much water it would take to produce the amount of hydrogen that we would need to run a whole economy off of hydrogen. I think it's naive to ignore the fact that water is uh, a precious commodity in, in moving forward. Um, however, if you are, and particularly these systems, it's an interesting point too because a lot of these systems operate best out in desert areas where there's not too much water. Um, so uh, a lot of people are looking at other inputs other than water to do these, these fuels. Um, in fact, one of the things we're looking at in my laboratory actually is to use biomass, to gasify biomass using solar energy. So there are other options that still go along the same route, but w it would be crazy to ignore water. I think it's a very, very important issue. It's a, it's a good thing you brought it up. Yes. You mentioned, or, 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 you, Tommy, I mentioned that you did some research on polymers. Yes. Um, what is the potential, with the, especially with copper being possibly going very expensive, <coughs> using polymers as solar hot water in solar? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into my extra slides. So close your eyes till I get to the one I want. Oh, not too far. Uh, this is actually a commercial system uh, that as um, uh, been through the SRCC uh, rating and certification process. Um, the absorber is a polymer, so it doesn't use a copper absorber. Um, 
the uh, glazing, or which would usually be low iron glass, is also a polymer. Um, the system has some limitations.